And welcome everyone again. Thank you so much for joining us today for today's Comrade Sci virtual talk. My name is Meredith Chagudis. I'm the Senior Director of Development in MSU's College of Communication Arts and Sciences, a college devoted to storytelling and the way we communicate and connect. So a little background about 22 weeks ago, but who's counting? Um, when most of the U.S. went remote, we watched our alumni quickly adapt and pivot, and we discovered an interest in the behind-the-scenes aspects of many Comrade Sci careers and industries, which prompted this webinar series about media and communication careers pivoting in the pandemic, and which leads us to today's eighth talk on corporate communication. So um, attendees, you will note that your microphone and video camera will be off, but we encourage you to ask questions throughout today. Use the Q&A function that's been enabled and we'll moderate that as we go. Also, please make sure that you tag us today with hashtag ComradeSciTalks. And with that, it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator for the next hour. Sean Turner is in his second year at MSU as a professor in the Department of Communication and is also still serving as a national security communication analyst for CNN. Sean is a retired Marine Corps officer and has served in communication leadership roles with governmental, private sector, and nonprofit organizations. So some of his previous positions include Director of Communication for U.S. National Intelligence at the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, Assistant Press Secretary for Foreign Affairs at the National Security Council, and Deputy White House Press Secretary for National Security under the Obama administration. In addition to that, on the academic side, Sean's previous experience includes positions with both the Daniel Morgan Graduate School of National Security in Washington, D.C., and the University of Pennsylvania Law School. So he is an established expert and practitioner in communication leadership, strategy, and crisis management, and we are truly fortunate to have him on our faculty. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing and turn it over to Sean to introduce our panelists. Well, Meredith, thank you for the kind introduction, and I want to welcome everyone to today's virtual talk on corporate communication. Uh, I, this is going to be a really interesting and engaging discussion, and I want to echo what Meredith said and encourage everyone to submit your questions because we've got three really fantastic expert panelists here to uh, help us work through some of these issues. Uh, the theme of this series is pivoting in the pandemic, and when we think about the ways that organizations have had to pivot to deal with the extraordinary circumstances caused by COVID-19, communication is right at the top of the list. So I don't think we can overemphasize the importance of this discussion and the need to share insights and ideas and lessons from some of the professionals who are out there leading these efforts. So, uh, so I, again, I encourage you to, to really uh, engage and participate in the discussion today. As I said, we're fortunate to have a great lineup of, of professionals, all MSU alum joining us for today's panel. I'm gonna take a minute to introduce them and then we'll dive right into the discussion. I wanna encourage you all to uh, look these individuals up on LinkedIn, connect with them. There is a wealth of knowledge and experience here and uh, you know, getting to know all of them. I know that for all of us who are out there trying to deal with these issues in our organizations, uh, these, these folks represent a great resource for us to, to reach out to and talk with. I'll give brief introductions, but I, I really do encourage you to look them up. Look them up. First, I want to I wanna welcome Jeff Lambert. Jeff is the CEO of Lambert & Company and the founder of Ticker. Lambert & Company is a strategic communications firm that specializes in public relations, investor relations, and integrated marketing. He earned his, his uh, bachelor's degree from Michigan, uh, Michigan State University in advertising in 1993. Uh, his firm is also uh, one of Michigan's largest PR firms and a top 50 PR firm in the United States. So Jeff has a wealth of experience. Jeff, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Uh, Brian Connor is the vice president of communications for Prince Princess Cruises. He leads a team accountable for all aspects of internal and external communication, including public and media relations, social media, cooperative partnerships, as well as issue and crisis response. He earned his BA in telecommunication from Michigan State University in 91. Brian, thanks for being here. Thank you, Sean. And last but not least is Terry Radigan. Terry is the Executive Director of Communications and Operations and Corporate Giving for General Motors. He leads a team of professionals that are focused on enhancing the image and reputation of General Motors and increasing employee engagement across the organization. 
Terry earned his BA in communication in 1987. Terry, thanks for being on the panel. My pleasure, Sean. So I want to start with a question for all of you because I think it will help shed light on the uniqueness of your experience over the past six months. You all represent different organizations, different industries and different organizations. And I know that you all had to approach issues of communication from different perspectives. So most organizations are accustomed to dealing with communication issues or the occasion, occasional communication crisis, but those events don't typically result in an entirely new normal for an extended period of time at that. So this pandemic is different, as we all know. And for a lot of communication professionals in, 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 in this industry, it's changed everything. So I'd like all of you to take a minute, take a step back, and I'd like to ask each of you to just take a minute and talk about that change. Talk about what your new normal looks like in the era of COVID-19 from a communications perspective. Uh, and Terry, I'd like to start with you if that's okay. Absolutely, thank you, Sean, for the question. Um, the new normal is um, something that for a guy who's been in the industry for 32 years, it was a big adjustment. I'm not a work from home guy. I'm an in the office guy early and stay late. And so it was personally an adjustment for me uh, to connect with people and to still be able to use technology to, um, you know, to supplant what normally would be basic human interaction. Uh, that first week we thought, you know, we were going to be home for a couple of weeks. And obviously that's not the case. So we had, um, we had a real dynamic going on with uh, our salaried employees, myself included, working from home. But for that first week anyway, we were hopeful that we could keep our uh, assembly plants operating. And so um, that didn't last very long either. So we had two, two communications challenges. One was uh, communicating with folks who are working from home, uh, maybe for the first time in their career, and then another communication challenge with the hourly employees, our, our UAW partners, who were asked to continue to build cars, trucks, and crossovers, um, at least for a short time there. So that was the real big challenge initially in the pandemic. All right, thanks, Terry. Uh, Jeff, what are, your, what are your thoughts on what your new normal looks like? Yeah, you know, it, uh, we, we had an early, early warning sign, if you will, from our uh, overseas clients. And many of our uh, many of our clients are in the automotive or manufacturing space. And so we, we started doing communications on plant shutdowns and staffing changes really late January, early February. And yet it didn't occur to me that this was going to truly impact our business as much as it did. Uh, and so we, we put together a COVID task force internally to say, hey, let's aggregate our communications and let's, you know, what we're, what we're communicating in one market, we can apply to another market. Uh, and so that was, that was really helpful. Uh, and then we had to pivot to, we need to communicate this uh, to, our, uh, to our own team. Uh, and we, you know, the practice of, of doing cor corporate communications to your own organization is, is obviously important. Uh, and it, like Terry said, it was, we expected to be out for a couple of weeks uh, and we're planning for that. And uh, it, kept, it, it kept rolling and rolling. And we, we've been out for four and a half months now. Uh, and it is, it is definitely feels like a new normal. And when will it end? Who, who really knows? Yeah. And I, and I certainly want to touch on some of those points, especially just this idea of, uh, of when it will end and what it looks like to get back to normal. Uh, Brian, I think uh, your new normal was probably a, a little different from both uh, Terry's and Jeff. What are your thoughts on what the new normal looks like for you? So, we're, Sean, we're still kind of figuring that out on a daily basis. And just to provide some context for the folks joining us today, um, I can remember back that I was first activated and my team was first activated to begin responding to, um, you know, what we didn't fully understand at the time was to become a global pandemic when our first ship, Diamond Princess, was in Japan. Um, probably one of the most high profile news stories in the early days of the pandemic. Um, because there were just so many unknowns. And because our ship was in Japan, we were under the authority and took direction from the Japan Ministry of Health. And so <clears throat> this was, I'll, I'll, I'll never forget this, it was Super Bowl Sunday is when we first started um, calls and when we first began to stand up our um, emergency response and, and emergency operations teams globally. Um, that operation for us and our industry and specifically for the Princess Cruises ships um, lasted well over 120. I think we're surpassing 150 days now. And after the initial wave of the crisis, our job didn't 
um, end there because um, after we got all of the guests disembarked from our ships that were all in different areas of the world, which presented a whole series of challenges, which we can talk about later, um, we then had to continue a mission or um, uh, essentially operations to repatriate our 28,000 crew members back to their home countries because uh, the public health authorities and the um, Customs and Border Authorities would not allow us to land them and fly them. So there were just um, a whole series of ongoing obstacles and hurdles that we had to get over. The new normal for us today has included um, a reduction in workforce of about 50% of our shoreside operations. So there are our shipboard folks who we, uh, to this day, are still continuing to try to travel home. Um, and we are very near the end of that process. But our new normal today includes a reduction in force of about 50% of its people. Um, specifically in my communications team, I went from a team of 12 people to four just for my brand. And then there's work that we do within our company that supports other brands as well. So, so the way I would describe the new normal is we um, work very closely with our executives to define what is our new scope of work in that new normal. Um, and we have a saying around Princess, ruthless prioritization. And whenever anyone, including my boss, who's the president of the company, att attempts to um, have scope creep, as we call it, in our job and in our accountability, um, I just remind her that I will be applying ruthless prioritization to everything we're being asked to do. Um, just to keep it in perspective, because um, it's very easy for uh, executives to want to continue communication and engagement with uh, all of our audiences, both internal and external. But I now have four people versus 12 to make that happen. Yeah, no, it's a really good point. And I, I want to dig, drill down on that a little bit and talk about sort of the substance of your communication operations uh, across the board. You know, prior to this pandemic, all of our organizations had crisis communication plans and procedures to deal with communication challenges. I wonder if you can talk for a minute about, minute about the critical importance of crisis communication planning and how your previous preparations actually ha did help you navigate what is, you know, obviously an unprecedented uh, situation. And I, and I think it'd be interesting for our, uh, for our listeners to know, you know, when we do crisis communication planning, it's our process to look across the board at all the possible things that can go wrong and to try to do some preparation for those things. As you answer, I wonder if you could all tell me, did anyone here actually plan for a global pandemic? Did you actually have a plan you pulled off the shelf in, in the event of a global pandemic? Uh, so, and if you do, I'd really be interested in hearing about that. Uh, so, uh, Jeff, if you can start us off, uh, let's talk a little bit about the substance of your crisis communication planning and, and how it helped you get through this. So, so we have crisis plans for dozens of our clients who are global, and not a single one has global pandemic as a category. Uh, you know, with, with, with that being said, uh, because we have a lot of clients, we can, we can apply what we're doing uh, to, to other countries or other, uh, other industries. You know, our, our crisis planning really begins with the all, all audiences and the audience prioritization. You know, Brian talked about the Ministry of Health in, in Japan. You know, the, the, the health organization, the local municipalities and their laws and regulations and orders quickly became a high priority. And so that was one of the biggest elements of a crisis plan that we never had, which was a state by state, country by country a customization of these crisis plans. And so we were, you know, for, a, for, a, for instance, a, a large auto supplier, Yazaki, we were doing work in Portugal and Honduras and Brazil, and each of those had their own customized communications, both order of audience uh, and co uh, communications protocol. And so the complexity, uh, it, it was a day by day, you know, tw every hour changing in many cases, uh, for, for crisis communication. So if, if ever there was, as, as we look, look back at this, I think it's probably going to be a Jimmy Fallon skit, you know, thank you, COVID. But, you know, we, we have been, uh, you know, our careers have never, didn't foresee this, but we will look back and say never more have we been battle tested uh, to be able to respond to, to something like this. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Terry, were there uh, things that you were already doing in your organization from a planning, a communication planning perspective that helped you uh, recognizing that 
nothing probably there was probably nothing that made this easy but were, were there things that have to get through it sean unfortunately or fortunately we are no stranger to crises we were just coming off of a 40-day strike last fall uh, a year and a half ago we did a major transformation and you know took some actions including closing plants um, you know, we had a recall that wasn't in the too, not too distant uh, past, as well as, you know, uh, a bankruptcy last decade. So we're pretty well prepared for, um, for crises, but uh, to answer your question, we didn't have one that I'm aware of uh, for a global pandemic. We also didn't have one for murder hornets. So you can't think of every eventuality, but you try. And uh, that's, that's really, I mean, like Jeff said, it's just something that, was unforeseen and we're it's changing every day um we uh we just roll with it and um and you know do so with uh with a newfound appreciation for uh the technology that allows us to keep going and um you know the last four and a half months have been the busiest of my career um and uh who'd have thought that like i said i've just not not ever been the type that would um would work from home, uh, generally speaking, but forced to, we, we found a way. And um, it's, it's amazing to see the team come together. Uh, mm -hmm. Even when we can't be together, we are together and aligned. And um, it, it's refreshing and um, frustrating and exhilarating all at the same time. Yeah, and I, I definitely want to talk more about uh, sort of uh, care and nurturing of teams. Uh, Brian, I want to come back over to you. I, I, I know that Princess Cruises certainly has plans for uh, an outbreak of a sickness aboard a ship. The, do the lessons that you learned from that and your experience in preparing for that, did those lessons sort of help you with, uh, with dealing with the, the global pandemic? Yeah, I would say they, they definitely did, Sean. I mean, of, of all of our panelists today, I'm sure it'll come as no surprise that um, I, I do have chapters of my um, crisis response manual that include public health, medical incidences, um, and so, you know, there was, there were foundational elements, um, you know, for better or worse, the cruise industry um, oftentimes um, gets um, disproportionately covered when it comes to outbreaks of influenza, for example, um, when statistically speaking, your chances of, of catching influenza um, on a cruise ship are uh, in incredibly uh, less opportunistic than they are if you're on a college campus per se, or even um, in your local community shoreside. So um, there were elements of our plan that certainly allowed us um, to be able to quickly stand up um, elements of messaging. Um, but you know, this there were just so many aspects of COVID that were unknown. Um, as Jeff also um, kind of talked about, when it came to being in foreign countries, um, our ships become under the authority, if you will, of the local ministry. And so um, we didn't, we weren't leading the crisis operation aspect of it, which came with some certain frustrations because an, an, in, an institution like the Japanese Ministry of Health um, would be leading, we would be supporting, we would be collaborating and cooperating. Um, but then when it came to communication, oftentimes um, there would be a yes, we'll coordinate with you on the communication, like please don't announce any more cases like and, until we can coordinate on this. Um, please don't announce any more deaths until we can coordinate on this. And inevitably, um, someone within the organization would leak the information. And so we were just always on the back foot playing catch up. So we had foundational elements in our plan, but there were just so many uh, um, other variables we did not have control of. Um, the first, you know, I would say four to six weeks of managing this um, were just, um, it, 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 we were kind of chasing our tail in some instances, as hard as we tried to align with the partners who were managing the operation. And certainly there was a language barrier as well, uh, attempting to try to deal with um, an organization that had one media relations person and the world's media wanted to talk to this person about what was happening and how they were managing the Diamond Princess outbreak. Yeah, absolutely. And it sounds to me as I listen to all of you that while it certainly is the case that no one could have planned for, prepared for a global pandemic, it does sound to me like you all found uh, and, and would endorse the idea that there is immense value in planning and at least having the infrastructure in place to be able to deal with massive communication challenges. And I think, you know, something that we all, you know, from our training and experience uh, know and understand. 
uh, I, I will tell you that, you know, encouraging people to do crisis communication planning, whether it's for a small crisis or a big crisis, no matter what happens, still helps you when, uh, when something happens. Uh, I want to go ahead and, and transition here a little bit and talk a, a little bit more about your industries, but also talk a little bit more about your internal communication and uh, how you manage the internal communication. So we all talk about getting back to normal, but whether it's in our, our day-to-day lives or in industry, we know that there are some changes that have been brought on by COVID-19 that will persist after the pandemic passes. So I want you all to talk a little bit about, little bit about how you think COVID-19 has changed the long-term future of your industry. Uh, and there's this idea of whether or not the normal that you had before COVID-19, whether you expect it to fully return, or if there are specific things that you think, you know, uh, they may come back, but they're going to come back slowly, or they may not come back at all. Uh, and, and I'm thinking about, you know, you know, there's uh, research out there that suggests that people are getting really comfortable with things like having their groceries delivered. And uh, people are getting really comfortable with shopping for things online that they never would have thought to shop for online. And when this is all over, there's a question as to whether or not they'll go back to the stores and go back and start doing those things the way we did them before. So apply that to your industry and give me a sense of what you think will get back to normal and what you think will persist. Uh, Jeff, how about you? You want to start us off? Sure. I think the, uh, you know, what I, what I have found through our experience, I, I'm, a, I'm an in-person, uh, in-person guy like Terry. I, I work from home thing. Uh, we had a lot of particularly millennials in our organization who were trying to push for work for home for years. And I didn't believe that they were, uh, quite frankly, responsible enough or mature enough to handle it. Well, I was wrong. And work from home, I think, will have a, a perpetual piece, place in, uh, in the PR industry, in, in the agency world. Uh, you know, we're, it's no longer cool to have a downtown New York office. Uh, when no one no one goes to it, and so this idea of having physical space, uh, really for presence and to show off to a uh, to a client or a customer, I think is going to forever change. So I think real estate is going to be significantly affected over uh, over the years. And we're looking at subleasing our New York office and reducing our Phoenix office, and where how do we play in that space in Michigan? Uh, and so I think that's a piece of it. One of the things we we found. By, by mistake, uh, it's not mistake it's as much as happenstance, but we made an acquisition at, at the beginning of March, right? At the beginning of COVID and did 100% virtual integration uh, of a merger and acquisition. And it was, uh, it was wonderful. It was efficient. Uh, it allowed us to do and me to do uh, to be, you know, many places at once. And so I think that's going to be something that we, we suddenly expand our pie of opportunities. And then maybe a final is, is our own meeting cadence. We started a weekly 411, 411 on, on Mondays, but that, you know, this, this constant communication, which at the time was necessary to daily, weekly uh, communicate, now has become really valued by our team, which is spread, spread out quite a bit. Uh, and so that constant communication, I think is gonna be a definite win from, from COVID. Absolutely. Uh, Brian, uh, you know, are, are people going to get back on uh, cruise ships? Will things get back to normal for your industry? Well, we certainly hope so. I mean, we're very optimistic about it, but there are just so many things at this juncture that are um, we're unable to determine. Uh, one of the things that our um, CEO, Arnold Donald, Princess is part of the Carnival Corporation. We're the largest leisure travel company in the world. And our CEO, Arnold Donald, hosted a summit recently um, that was strictly to explore the science of all of it and essentially what he said and committed to was that as an industry we will follow the science so um, if you look at our booking trends if you look at future bookings for our industry um, uh, it's strong um, the the only cancellation processing that's happening right now are the voyages that we have canceled you know COVID-19 brought the global cruise industry to a screeching halt um, we have extended, we previously, we were, we were one of the first brands to announce pausing our global operation. We've now extended that twice. And so we will not be operating um, through the uh, through middle of December. We're hoping that we can get all of the necessary protocols in place. Um, as I'm sure everyone can imagine, we're looking at all aspects of the operation because you um, sort of unlike a um, shoreside hotel or resort, 
that might be able to be profitable running at 50% occupancy. We cannot operate a cruise ship at 50% occupancy. So um, there are a lot of things we need to look at and our operations team um, is doing that. And of course, um, our ability to go back into service is gonna be predicated on organizations like this um, Center for Disease Control looking at our return to service plan to say, okay, you have all the necessary protocols in place. Um, you know, we do have world-class medical um, and public health um, professionals that are part of the Princess team. They run medical centers on board the ships. And so we are literally looking at every aspect of what it would require to return to service from the minute you arrive at the cruise terminal, your entire shipboard experience for seven days um, and everything in between. So there's still a lot to be determined. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, Terry, we're starting to get some great questions coming in. Uh, so I'd like you to, to address this issue of the, of the automotive industry and what you think will persist from COVID-19. But then I, we've got some communication questions I'm looking forward to putting to the panel as well. Okay, yeah, quickly, I could just tell you, Sean, the way we show vehicles, the way we uh, introduce them to the media, introduce them to our employees, to our investors, is changing. Because all of that was event-based. That was... Uh, either at the North American International Auto Show or at a standalone event, we would have hundreds of people and they'd all crowd around the car afterwards. We call it a scrum and they'd interview our executives, take pictures of our cars. None of that's happening. Um, the Tahoe and Suburban, luckily we had just launched those or revealed those and we were getting ready to drive them. And that too is, a, is an event based. We get, bring all the people in together, all the media, and we run waves and waves and waves. And all of that has to be rethought. And so when is that coming back? I don't know. We had a great electric uh, vehicle event, EV Day in Warren, just about the same time that Jeff was doing a merger and acquisition there in early March. And we had hundreds of people from all of our audiences and constituents all checking out the future of General Motors and our all EV future. And that was literally a week before we shut the whole thing down. So uh, when that's coming back is anybody's guess. Right now we're having to be very creative with how we show vehicles like the Cadillac Lyric that we did a virtual event last stuff uh, last Thursday night. Yeah. And, you know, as I listen to you all, you know, the, the one common theme I hear through all of this is that for those of us who are responsible for training the next generation of communication professionals, we need to make sure they come to the table with creative ideas, with innovation, the ability to figure out new ways to uh, you know, get products and services out in front of people. Uh, because I think that you're right, that if, if the way we've done things in the past, if we're not gonna completely get back here, we need, we need some new approaches here. Uh, I'm gonna uh, switch here. Uh, we've got a couple of questions that uh, I wanna put to the group. Uh, one, uh, one listener asked whether or not you all have uh, separate communication plans for your external versus your internal audience, audiences and whether and where you kind of put your effort as COVID-19 kicked in. Because as COVID-19 kicked in, you know, you had people who worked in your organizations who were heavily impacted and, um, and, and needed to uh, be concerned about their health and safety. But you also had, you know, your customers and your stakeholders outside the organization. As communication professionals, where was the bulk of your effort? And did you have to bounce, make some adjustments there Whereas normally, if you've got an external crisis, you don't need to communicate as much internally. So, uh, Brian, you want to start off uh, on that one? Because I think it was really significant for your team. Yeah, it really was. So um, let me just also provide a little more context. You know, the first, um, as I hinted at earlier, the first six, seven, eight, almost 10 weeks of our response, we were at our office campus in Southern California. We had... Um, uh, emergency response operations centers that were linked via Cisco video 24 seven. Um, I had an entire conference room I took over that was the, we called it communication central. And I had as many as 16 people working in this particular room at one time. Um, thankfully, the magnitude of this was so great that I had to take my core team of 12 people and I went and borrowed, and this was a real, um, Kind of a real eye opener of like a, a, an immediate need that had to, had to be addressed for how effective we were in responding to this. I went and recruited marketing directors, uh, marketing managers, um, people who handled um, all of the development of marketing and communications for the shipboard experience, um, who were able to put their jobs on hold. I was able to grab people who did consumer, and I literally had a communication central operation that what became a content publishing hub. 
And so to link this to a response to this question specifically, um, my internal comms person was sitting to my right, my external comms person was sitting to my left, and literally as the information was being developed primarily for an external um, channel first, reviewed by legal, um, which is important because as many of you know as, as communicators, um, what you say can and, be, uh, can and will be used against you. Um, and so uh, the, all of those disciplines were seeing and hearing and were, were right in lockstep about the development of the communication. And I would say we generated equal if not more internal communications during that time uh, than we did external, but there was just a constant flow throughout all those channels. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, Jeff, any thoughts on that, on this topic? Yeah, I think this, you know, unlike other crises that we would handle for clients, it affected us, uh, maybe not, not as much, but certainly at, at the same pace that it was affecting our clients. And so we actually found ourselves creating internal content and then really sharing that same internal content with our clients as a resource for their HR department or their communications department, not as, as part of our scope of work, but because we felt like this was learnings that we had spent some time on that why not, why not share it? So as, you know, as the, the North American International Auto Show was debating whether they're going to go forward and then they don't, how do, how do our clients, how do our automotive suppliers or OEs and others, how do they deal with that? Well, we're, we're grappling with that on behalf of clients. Why not share that with the industry? So I think we had equal amount of, uh, equal amount of internal communication as we did external communication for, every, for ourselves, but also every client. Uh, because your people are dealing with this. How, how do they work from home? How do they deal with childcare issues? How do they deal with two, two working spouses? There, there are real challenges in, in actually executing the work for, for our organization, for other organizations. And so it was, you know, take care of your people first, I think, in prioritization. Uh, and then, you know, how do you help, uh, help others through that? Yeah, absolutely. Terry, what are your thoughts on the internal versus external communication focus? Yeah, Br Brian said it, you know, lockstep, you've got one on your right and one on your left. There isn't two plans, Sean, there's, there's one plan. You know, we have a fascinating dynamic at General Motors because um, f uh, our chairman and CEO, Mary Barra, spent 18 months in internal communications. She ran it for us uh, back in the 90s and I think really has helped to just make it part of our culture, tell employees first, have empathy. So it's really, really important. You know, yesterday we had an announcement when our um, CFO decided to, to leave the company and Mary started the day yesterday with a senior leader call globally, got them all on the phone to tell them the news so they would hear it from us first. Um, they could cascade it down to their, uh, their team and, and Mary hosted that call and she does that numerous times throughout the year many, many times during the pandemic to just get everyone together. Sometimes it's just her core senior leader team. Sometimes it's all executives globally, but Mary drives that we will be internal and external focused um, with equal weight. Yeah, absolutely important. Hey, hey Sean, I just yeah. had one other thing I wanted to share. A, a real learning for us from this, especially in those first, as I've said, six, eight, 10 weeks was that you know, when, when the Diamond Princess incident broke out, that was um, followed a few weeks later by Grand Princess, which was in Northern California. And essentially the media just wanted to cover this because it was super sensational. Um, and there was just so much we didn't know we didn't know. Um, certainly as an operator, we understood the public health aspect. We have extensive cleaning protocols if um, influenza breaks out and, and things of that nature. But what we discovered was is that because the media just wanted to make us the bad guy in the story and, oh, how could you be operating your cruise ships when this happened? Um, we realized we just weren't going to get a fair shake on this. And so we took matters into our own hands. And as part of our crisis communication plan, and I talked a little bit about how I borrowed people from marketing, um, I had marketing directors and marketing managers who were solely assigned to helping us develop the scripts that became the videos that became the executive updates that we literally published about every other day in our quest to control the message because the media just was not interested in our side of the story and all the things we were doing to try to work cooperatively with entities like the Ministry of Health, 
Um, and so, you know, the, the one place we knew we could control the message was on our own channels. Um, and if, you know, if a student were to want to go do a case study and go back and look at the Princess Facebook channel, um, it, would, it would be a real learning experience to see the tempo and the pace and the consistency at which we were generating executive updates. And thankfully, later on in the process, media started to pick it up and actually started to use some of it as content. Yeah, no, that's, that's a, a great point and a great segue because I think for all of you, there are the, the uh, external influences that certainly to some degree uh, govern how you uh, run a crisis communication plan. And we've got a question from a viewer that kind of segues to that and, and, and touches on that. You know, typically in a crisis, what an organization decides to do is really based on what uh, people like you and, and other leaders in the organization decide it's, is best to manage that crisis. But with the global pandemic, you, had the, you have the external influence of guidance and regulation from CDC and from, federal, from uh, a state and federal organizations that to some degree restrict and limit and guide and direct what you do. And I wonder if we could just briefly touch on how, um, how you manage the, the issue of what you want to do as a company that needs to survive and, and continue to serve your stakeholders and your employees in relation to sort of what you were having imposed on you or what you felt like you needed to do as a result of, of those outside forces. Uh, Terry, can you start with, with that one? Sure, you know, we have um, obviously uh, a, a story to tell with regard to how we, we uh, changed our business model uh, when we stopped making cars, trucks, and crossovers, we started making ventilators and masks uh, for frontline workers. And uh, especially as it relates to the ventilators, you know, we were uh, handed um, a Defense Production Act uh, by the president, and uh, we were already well on our way of, of converting our Kokomo, Indiana plant into a ventilator facility. But um, it, uh, it, that, that was a, um, a move that, that was made by the administration to, you know, to accelerate that. We got this thing turned around in 30 days. We've already made 20,000 uh, ventilators. We will hit our target for 30,000 by the end of the month. And um, so that, that was one example where, you know, an extraneous or external force um, was uh, prodding us, but, but really prodding us on a path that we were already on. Absolutely. Jeff, did you have thoughts on this topic? Yeah, so we, again, we were working both domestically and internationally and had several both states and countries where a political official decided that they wanted to put pressure on, you need to close this plant or you need to close this operation, oftentimes based on hearsay. So it was, we heard there was 20, you know, 20 breakouts of COVID in, in this facility and you need to shut it down. And so we were fighting the battle of you know, staying, staying open and the battle of misinformation. Uh, meanwhile, doing it all in, uh, you know, in the light of day through the media. Uh, and so it was certainly, we had several, several instances where we were, again, fighting this battle on several fronts, uh, which can be very frustrating when, when the control is taken out of your hands uh, and you really like to be focused on helping people and continuing to operate and stay in business but it was you know, people's view of how you should run your operation or your organization. Yeah, absolutely. And Brian, I did a little bit of research and, and while I was, I was looking at what the uh, CDC is requiring for organizations with regard to health and safety standards, but also looking at sort of what's standard for the, uh, for the cruise industry. And, if, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but it looks as though your sort of normal operating procedures, your standards, are more stringent than the federal guidelines for uh, these sort of health and safety issues that we're talking about now as we look to get back to normal. Yeah, I mean, they always have been, frankly. Um, we've been operating that way for years. Um, you know, the industry uh, has evolved in such a manner um, that, uh, you know, it's, it's a floating hotel resort casino. And so when you have that many people who are that close, um, our crew and staffing complement is designed um, to keep the facility clean and, and high touch surfaces. And we have, we have protocols on board that we can sort of quietly and immediately snap into where all of a sudden all the salt and pepper shakers disappear from the tables and all you have are the, tear, the paper tear packets. And you know, if needed, when you approach um, high traffic areas like the buffet, 
Um, instead of you reaching for the tongs, one of our crew members is there and they've got gloves on and they will help you with your portions. And so there are things that we've been doing for many years that fit into all of this. Um, but, you know, at the same time, this has also introduced a lot of new questions um, having to do with things like air circulation. Um, little unknown fact to most people, but on board our cruise ships, we have the ability to actually adjust and control the mix of air that goes into each individual cabin. And so there were early news reports that were saying that part of the reason so many people on Diamond Princess contracted COVID was because it was traveling through the air vents. That was actually false. Um, they did not find traces of COVID in the air vents. And we later then went back and said, by the way, our technology has the ability that we can turn all of the air going into the cabins to fresh air. So none of that air is recirculating. So, you know, throughout this process, there was a lot of what we were doing, which was educating people on protocols and um, operating procedures that had long existed, but then further um, sort of squelching the rumors and sort of the myths that were being reported upon um, by virtue of some of the technology and systems and functions that were available um, on a vessel like a, a passenger cruise ship. Yeah. Uh, Terry, let me ask you, we'll, we'll, we've got a couple of questions on marketing and how, um, as we talk about our industries and as we talk about our products, how the marketing picture has changed. And I really put this out there for all of you. Has COVID-19 caused safety and, 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 and health and the degree to which people will be able to engage with your company and your organization, your products, has that become part and parcel to your marketing? Uh, you know, two years ago when we thought about, you know, a commercial, we didn't feel the need to talk about safety and health necessarily because, you know, we could talk about our products. But is it different now that now you have to integrate that into your marketing? No, no question about it. And, and one thing that was an advantage for us is a couple of years ago, we came up with a new marketing tool called Shop Click Drive, which was really targeted for people who don't like to go to car dealerships. And you know, uh, a lot of people feel that way. They'd rather go to the dentist than go to the car dealership to buy a car. Uh, so we had the shop click drive system that was underutilized, but it was there. And boy, was that a, a lifesaver for us in, uh, in April. We had an amazing month of sales in April, uh, really strong um, in May and June. And in fact, it was, it, it, it was our dealers selling out of an empty lot, unfortunately, because you know, inventories are still not where we need them to be. But that was one key thing that, that really became um, a, an advantage, a competitive advantage for us uh, was the fact that folks didn't have to go to the dealership. It was contact-free um, delivery of a vehicle. We've got, um, we've got other things that are, are working uh, with our OnStar. You know, OnStar certainly is all about safety and security. And uh, we were able to do some things there with regard to folks that even didn't have um, an OnStar subscription, but we threw them, um, you know, data for their, uh, for, for their car so that they could have Wi-Fi and other things that just mattered in this t extraordinary time of crisis. If we could be there for our customers a bit uh, from a safety and security perspective, we certainly wanted to do that. And I think that will continue. Yeah, absolutely. Jeff, uh, for your clients, uh, are they, you know, are you advising them to make uh, the sort of health and safety of their customers a part of their marketing strategy? You know, absolutely. Although I would say that we took a, you know, a two or three months, there was a gap in the positive, you know, positive storytelling product launches, this idea that the media really wasn't interested uh, and, and consumers were so overwhelmed by COVID related uh, news activity, what's, what's the latest day by day, that it was very hard to break through the clutter of any kind of positive story. Uh, and so we found some, we've got a client called UV Angel that has a, a technology that using ultraviolet cleaning can kill and disinfect COVID and, and, and many other bacteria, taking that story and then saying, how can this be applied to a retailer or a real estate play? And so actually putting clients together to do more positive storytelling and tell the story of what we're doing internally, again, for our clients, what are they doing internally with their teams, with their facilities, with their cruise ships, with their, uh, with, with their grocery stores to, to create an environment to welcome those, those customers back. So it was, 
it wasn't as much kind of po positive storytelling as it was communicating that consistent message of we have a safe environment, an opportunity for you to engage with our product, with our service uh, in a way that may, may feel different, but is, is safe, healthy, and, uh, and still a, a great experience. Yeah. How are you all dealing with the uh, reality that even as the pandemic was, it, it was playing out and continues to play out, there are a number of other major issues playing out in society. Uh, you know, we, we had uh, issues of, of protests in countries, in, in states across the country. Uh, we had a lot of organizations looking internal at uh, sort of, uh, you know, their marketing and advertising and sort of historic norms and making some decisions that some of the things that they had been doing and, and not really thinking about in the current context needed to be changed. I wonder if you could talk for just a minute uh, about whether or not what was happening in that context had an impact on your organization and what it was like. If so, what it was like to have to really manage two very distinct and very different sort of communication challenges at the same time. Uh, Brian, can you start us off with that one? Yeah. Um, you know, Princess is an international cruise line. We sail people from all over the world. Um, I think, you know, that's, an, that's part of the experience that people expect with us, meaning there are hundreds of ethnicities, people from different cultures, you know, it's kind of part of our brand promise. Um, you know, we take you on these vacations to places where you'll meet new people, uh, be introduced to new cultures, try new foods. And so, you know, there's many aspects about the cruising experience globally that, that I think just sort of promotes the interest and intrigue of other cultures. Um, and so I, I would say somewhat thankfully, um, that did not become an issue or a distraction for us because we had so many other things we were managing just from an operation and a public health point of view. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Terry, Terry, how about uh, for your uh, employees uh, at, at GM? Uh, was what was happening in, in society uh, having an influence internally? Yeah, no question about it. You know, we, I, I never thought in, in mid to late May that anything could supplant the COVID pandemic from the front page of the papers and, uh, you know, it dominated all newscasts. It was the only story. And, and then on Memorial day, when George Floyd was murdered, it was a game changer. And, um, yeah, we, we, I'm proud that, that our company jumped right into it. Uh, it was important to, uh, for Mary, our, our chairman and CEO to make a, a, a bold and firm statement about it. Um, and not only a, a statement, an expression of, of sympathy, but also a, an expression of, of anger and of um, action. So she promised that by the end of the quarter, uh, we would stand up an internal, uh, excuse me, an inclusion advisory board of, of inside the company folks as well as outside the company. Um, we delivered on that promise. We also um, made a commitment to uh, $10 million toward uh, you know, DE&I uh, organizations. The first million went to the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, and we're still working through how the rest of the money will be spent. But uh, yeah, that was a that was a phenomenal. We were really dealing with two crises at the same time, two significant crises, and um, there was no doubt that that was uh, that was a game changer for us. Yeah, absolutely. Jeff, any thoughts on this topic? Yeah, I can speak from kind of two two lenses. One uh, would be from a client perspective. It, it it happened, and I was very proud of the clients, the CEOs who leaned into it and said, "We want to do a you know, we want to do a letter, we want to do a response, uh, but we want to put action behind that," as, as as General Motors and and many other organizations did. And that was really our encouragement: was let's just not write a letter or post something on Facebook. Uh, it, unless we intend to back it up with action. Uh, and so I think that's, that, you know, this, it was, it, it took over the, uh, it took over the world out in, out in front of COVID. Uh, and so it was, it was actually ex exciting to see the momentum. I, I think the, for, for us internally, I really was really, in, um, the, the impact of that on me was, was in many ways personal. And I, I felt like I needed to do something beyond just uh, telling my team uh, you know, how terrible it is and how we're going to fight racism and just and fight for justice. Uh, so it started a, a nonprofit called americantbreathe.org. Uh, and it was, I did it quietly uh, with really, really a cadre of other 
primarily white CEOs who wanted to put action to our words, uh, but uh, it, it has got some momentum and americantbreed.org is really intended to put dollars into black businesses, uh, black entrepreneurs and uh, nonprofits serving the black community and fighting for, for racial justice. And, and so it, it, it wasn't about uh, me as much as it was about something that I wanted to create a forum for other people to, who were saying, what do we do? We, do we just write a check to Black Lives Matter and be done? Or can we actually institute this in our organization through a series of actions that I think are going to be transformational over the next year and decade? Yeah, I, I think it's, a, I, I asked this question because I, I, I think it's a really important point to make. You know, I, I had a, a form recently where I had someone say, look, you know, we're dealing with a pandemic and there are no other crises when you're dealing with a pandemic. And I think that what we saw happen uh, with regard to uh, George Floyd uh, really sends a message that even when we're in the midst of a crisis, there are still other things that can impact an organization and we still have to be uh, nimble and flexible and able to deal with those things. I want to get in a question uh, from Katie Smith. Uh, uh, Jeff and Terry, Katie asks, can you talk a little bit about Michigan's business climate and why you feel strongly about doing business in Michigan? They, she wants you to talk a little bit about the advantages and, and what you find here regarding talent, workforce, location, et, et cetera. So, uh, uh, Terry, you want to, want to take that one? Sure. Yeah, we're, um, we're obviously a, a major employer in, in the city of Detroit, in Flint, in Lansing, uh, all over in, in Macomb County and Warren. And um, we think it's a fantastic place to do business or we wouldn't be here. Um, the, 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 the uh, quest for talent is huge and that's why education is so important. That's why we're putting a lot of money behind STEAM, uh, STEM efforts and um, you know, just trying to build the talent base so we can continue to draw uh, uh, people into our company. We need software engineers, we need uh, designers, we need you know, all the cadre of, of, of folks that we need. Um, you know, getting people to come to Michigan who are not familiar with it. Sometimes they have a stigma about Detroit or about Michigan. Once they get here, they find that it's a fantastic place to live, to work, to raise a family. But sometimes we do have to overcome that, uh, that stigma. But we're, we're recruiting from, from all over the place. Um, and, uh, and we're finding really good talent. But the, the, I'd say the biggest challenge right now for the economy and for the business climate in Michigan his talent. Yeah, I'll just tag. On, I'll just tag on to that. I mean, we, I started the, the, my my agency in Michigan. I'm from uh, Michigan. I, I I correlate the Michigan man, mentality to being a Spartan, which is it, it always feels like we have a bit of a chip on our shoulder. And we're the underdog, and, and maybe we we use that to our advantage. Uh, but we're now the largest agency in Michigan. We have clients in 20 states. Uh, but it is a wonderful place to live. It's a wonderful place to raise a family and a tenacity of talent in Michigan is very strong. And, you know, so we, we just launched a startup. We did it in downtown Detroit. Uh, you know, that's going to be the market that is Michigan, I think has a tremendous upside. I will, I will say because of COVID and because of things like this, doing virtual conferences and being able to connect to people all over the country and all over the world, I think we now can grow our, you know, talent reach so we can now bring people back to Michigan uh, in, virtually, we can we can pitch new clients nationally that was were more difficult in the past, and so having this jumping off point, a very strong market with really good talent who have a bit of a, a tenacious chip on their shoulder, I think is a, is a real advantage. So yeah, M Michigan is a great place to to be founded, to be uh, and to be based. And Brian, you're just waiting for the day when you move back to Michigan, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I've been here 30 years. I'm not sure that that's going to happen. <laughs> Uh, listen, I, you know, as we, as we have this conversation, one of the things that keeps uh, rolling through my mind is, is that, you know, you all, you're all products of Michigan State University. And uh, as, you, as you know, you know, in, the, in, in ComArt Sci, it's our job to train the next generation of professional communicators and make sure that when we send them out there, that they come to the table with a robust skill set so that they understand how to help you uh, and be a value part, value part of your team as you navigate these challenges. So I wonder if you can all just take a minute to say, you know, just imagine, you know, you just got a Spartan who showed up and he's, he's put, in, put in an application. He wants to be a part of your team. Talk a little bit about the things that you want that Spartan to bring to the table 
to make sure that they add value to your team and can really help you as you deal with some of these significant challenges. Brian, you want to start us off? Sure. Um, uh, regardless of what you, the role or function would be, I need you to be able to write, 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 write. Um, as I shared a little bit earlier, when I activated my communication central emergency response team and I started borrowing people from marketing, um, I grabbed the copywriter from the creative studio, I grabbed other um, specialists and individuals, and I just was like, do you have writing skills? Do you have writing? And you know, I went to their bosses and I, you know, I was qualifying who these folks were, but um, I could never have too many writers. And you know, that played itself out even further as I shared a little bit earlier in the session, how we went from a crisis response operation to a repatriation operation where I had um, ships not only from the Princess brand, but from other brands within my corporation who um, they were gathering in certain areas and we were putting um, people from the same country on certain ships. There was a whole other fleet communication function that had to happen as well. And to this day, I still have individuals who you know, aren't necessarily people that served on my comms team this whole time who were the copywriters or who were, who were a marketing person um, but had great writing skills who are still writing communication for that. The second thing I would say is, again, regardless of what discipline you're going to pursue, if you have a general understanding about the process of how marketing communications and how um, even PR messaging is developed, but more specifically how content is created, that was the other rule I could not have too much help on. Um, were folks who understood how to write a script and who could assist the more senior people with video production and the creation of content um, that helped us do what I shared earlier about, which was get messages out on our own channels and control the message. Great points all around. Jeff, how about you? I, I would say I agree with, with Brian on the writing, absolutely. Um, I would say a, a lens of a kind of integrated communication. So we're going to all become brand journalists as we uh, as we move into the future, fewer media, uh, more owned media, uh, but the ability to understand all aspects of ComArtsI, which is, you know, you've got PR, you've got journalism, you've got advertising, even sales. And, and that'd be my second point, which is the ability to understand that all of this communication is intended to drive a business or organizational outcome. And so take a business class or uh, you know, read the Wall Street Journal, but get a sense and understand industry and, and business. So you, you really, we're all working toward uh, improving an organizational outcome. And, and I don't think there's enough emphasis on that, on that business piece. Yeah, absolutely. Terry, you want to take us home? Yeah, they, they stole my answer because I was going to say writing and business acumen. <laughs> and that's exactly what they they talked about. So that, then, what what's the final piece? It's 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 effort, it's attitude, it's optimism. It's someone who wants to be part of the team, wants to collaborate, wants to work with people. Um, and, and we get that from our from our Michigan State interns. We get that from the the new hires that we that come in. So I really think that there's something about the uh, Spartan spirit uh, when they when they arrive, and we have a lot of them on our team. They are collaborators, and this school is, is providing uh, talent to not just to General Motors, but to companies all over the place of people who want to come in. They're hunger, hungry to learn, hungry to contribute, and they're great team players, and that's what we're looking for, and that's frankly what we get out of uh, ComArtsI. Yeah, absolutely. Well, gentlemen, this has been a great discussion, and I could, uh, I could go on for another hour here, but uh, we're going to go ahead and wrap it up. I want to thank all of you, Brian, Jeff, Terry, for your candor and for your thoughtful answers. Uh, I'm sure that everyone here got a lot out of it. And I want to thank everyone who submitted their questions. I'm going to go ahead and turn it back over to Meredith to close this out. Thank you for being a great moderator. Thanks to our fantastic Spartan panel. And I think your closing question was perfect. I mean, all three of these individuals are really, they continue to hire Spartan interns and hire Spartan graduates. So thank you, gentlemen, for that. We really appreciate it. Um, and thank you to our audience for tuning in. We appreciate you joining us today and look forward to providing you with future talks. Our next talk actually has a special twist. So two weeks from today, Dean Prabhu David is hosting a conversation with April Clovis, CEO of MSU Federal Credit Union and Scott Weiss, CEO of Speakeasy. So watch your inbox for the follow-up from today, for the survey and for the next invitation and have a great day. Go green. Go away.